I want to give everyone a second to trickle in here. Um, all right, well, let's get started here. Um, good morning. I'm John S. Van uh, Editor-in-Chief of China Brief and China Program Manager at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, DC. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining us this morning uh, for our webinar on China, the United States, and the Pacific Island countries. Obviously, uh, over the past week, uh, there's been a great deal of focus on uh, Taiwan, uh, but we're going to look at another area of the Pacific uh, today uh, where the rivalry between the U.S. and China has heated up of late, uh, which is the Pacific Island countries. So this spring, uh, the Solomon Islands uh, and China announced a security agreement. This was followed uh, by uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's tour of eight Pacific Island countries uh, in May and June. And during the tour, uh, Foreign Minister Wang proposed a sweeping uh, trade and security agreement uh, with the 10 countries in the region that have relations with uh, Beijing. Although the deal ultimately uh, did not uh, materialize, um, China did sign uh, 52 uh, bilateral uh, agreements uh, with countries uh, in the with Pacific Island countries. Of course, uh, and in response to China's growing involvement in the region, uh, the US has recently uh, prioritized uh, its own high level engagement uh, with the Pacific Island countries. Uh, Biden, uh, uh, President Biden's Asia security czar, Kirk Campbell, uh, led a high-level delegation to the region, and Vice President uh, Kamala Harris addressed the Pacific Islands Forum recently. And of course, we know that competition involving China in the region isn't no, new. Uh, it's home to several of Taiwan's uh, remaining uh, diplomatic allies, uh, four of them. Uh, but still, I think the current competition, uh, the current geopolitical competition uh, involving uh, the U.S., China, and U.S. allies such as Australia uh, is really taking it up another level. Uh, at the same time, other countries in the region have expressed uh, very real concerns uh, with transnational uh, challenges, uh, particularly uh, economic development, uh, uh, climate change, and public health issues. Okay, we've got uh, two fantastic uh, panelists here uh, to talk us through these issues. Uh, we have Ambassador uh, C. Stephen McGann, uh, who is the founder of the Stevenson Group, uh, an international consulting firm, and an affiliate at the Center for Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, importantly, he has a, a great deal of direct experience uh, in the region as a high-level uh, U.S. diplomat. He was ambassador to the Pacific, uh, to the republics of Fiji, Nauru, Kiribati, and the kingdoms of Tonga and Tuvalu from 2008 to 2011. We also have with us uh, Cleo Pascal, who's a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and was for many years an associate fellow at the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House in London. And she's written extensively on this topic, including in her capacity as the North America Special Correspondent for the Sunday Guardian. Okay, with that, um, I'm going, I've talked enough. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador McGann, who's going to talk us through um, how this intensifying uh, geopolitical competition uh, between the U.S. and China uh, looks to the countries uh, in the region and how they see themselves in this shifting uh, international landscape. Ambassador McGann, uh, over to you. And thanks so much uh, for joining us this morning. Well, John, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm exceptionally pleased to be on this panel today with uh, Cleo Pascal, uh, my good friend. And one of the things that's very difficult about being on a panel with Cleo is that we agree on so many things. So what I wanted to do to, uh, this morning was to look at ways in which we can better contextualize what's going on uh, in the relationships within the big powers, the US, Australia, New Zealand, China, uh, as well as using today's topical situation regarding the question of Taiwan. Uh, 
and how that fits into the overall structure of our engagement in the Pacific, how Pacific Island countries view themselves and how they want to sort out the policy priorities in the region. Now, by coincidence, much of my observations today come from both being a observer of history and a participant at the same time as a practitioner. So that most people don't realize uh, that my actual first assignment in the Foreign Service in 1979 was to be part of the first cohort uh, to the American Institute in Taiwan. Uh, exactly at the time in which we began to implement the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, changing our recognition uh, from, uh, uh, from Taipei to Beijing. Now, what's important about that is understanding the beginnings of Taiwan's overall approach and engagement in the Pacific and how Pacific Island countries have viewed Taiwan. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, Taiwan being my first assignment, but it also coincided with the very first time I served as a duty officer uh, was the night of the Gaoshan riots, which was the uh, call by the then fledgling Taiwan independence movement uh, for a greater separation between uh, Taiwan uh, and, uh, and, and China or the People's Republic of China, to be exact. <laughs> and what we saw uh, at that time was in very clear ways, the, at, on a granular level, uh, the first implementation of the Taiwan Relations Act because uh, as a junior officer, I was also assigned to provide consular protection for the American wife of the leader of the Taiwan independence movement. But that, that night in Kaohsiung also in very many ways was, I always view as the first spark in the competition for diplomatic recognition because it also uh, put Beijing on notice that there were uh, factors, elements within Taiwan that wanted to push for a much more autonomous independent status. And while we talk about uh, that initial engagement with Taiwan. Uh, I also served at the UN working on uh, issue, issues such as a global ban on fish, uh, fishnet, drift, driftnet fishing, uh, which impacted upon the uh, fishing practices of not just Japan, but also Taiwan and China. More importantly, as later on as director, for the Office of Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific uh, Island Affairs, I repeatedly met with representatives of Taiwan uh, on the margins of the Pacific uh, Island Forum post-dialogue forum meeting, uh, and actually cha uh, traveled in, to Taipei in 2007 to encourage Taiwan to move away from direct support of Pacific Island country politicians and to begin funding broader development assistance programs. I also, by coincidence, as the record, also traveled to Beijing uh, to talk about their goals in the Pacific in the aftermath of the 2006 uh, Salmon Islands uh, uh, riots more so in preparation for my assignment uh, as our ambassador based in Suva, I always like to draw attention uh, to the fact that in my confirmation hearing statement, I made it very, very clear that we would continue to engage with representatives of Taiwan, uh, both uh, based in the Taipei Economic uh, and Cultural Affairs Office uh, in Suva, as well as meeting with the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps whenever I traveled to Tarawa, uh, capital of Kiribati, who by coincidence happened to also be uh, 
the ambassador of Taiwan to Kiribati. So the point I'm really starting off with was that these were just not uh, new elements in our uh, Pacific policy that we see today, but a growing trend toward engaging Pacific Island countries in the dynamic of China and Taiwan based on not only our regional goals, but also the preferences of Pacific Island countries. And Pacific Island countries made it very clear that while they were, most of them were willing uh, to comply with UN uh, General Assembly Resolution 2758, which transferred representation of China from the People's Republic of China, uh, uh, rather the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China, they were also very clear that the Pacific Island countries saw Taiwan as a legitimate Pacific entity uh, with interest in the region and a capable partner to provide development assistance uh, and economic growth help beyond the competition for diplomatic recognition. And so I think we even see that manifested uh, in just last uh, month's Pacific Island Forum meeting in which all of the big powers uh, were excluded from the meeting in Suva, including post-dialogue forum partners, uh, precisely because the Pacific Island countries wanted to press their priorities for the region. And their priorities for the region are based a lot on one key factor. They did not want the United States and its strategic partners in the region to really have a policy against China, but they want a policy that establishes priorities for the Pacific. And this is a very key in our understanding of how they engage with both, um, with both entities, uh, the PRC and Taiwan, and in their relationship with us. And so, one of the things that we begin to see is that despite uh, the competition for diplomatic recognition, we see Taiwan engaging in the comprehensive and uh, progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. We see Taiwan as an important, playing an important role in the Pacific Island Leadership Program that's actually sponsored by the East-West Center. And most importantly, uh, because they're not UN agencies, Taiwan has a, has a role to play and supports organizations that are part of the Council of, uh, it's called the Council of Regional Organizations of the Pacific or crop agencies. And so when we start understanding uh, this dynamic of how the Pacific Island countries view themselves, how they are very clear that in their own minds that the multilateral organizations that Pacific Island countries create themselves also include territories, representatives of different political parties uh, within territories that it is not uncommon at all for Pacific Island countries to view Taiwan as another Pacific partner, uh, notwithstanding the strategic competition between the US and other powers in China. But in fact, what Pacific Island countries are trying to do is to, as I said, make sure that the overall uh, objectives of the United States when it comes to meeting our national security goals also are consistent with the human security concerns of Pacific Island countries. And this is manifested not only as we see uh, in multilateral organizations, it's also seen in how the countries of the Free Associated States and, in the, and as well as other Micronesian countries in the North Pacific uh, view their overall status, and particularly 
uh, for the freely associated state uh, countries that they see the COFA as being insufficient in its application to meet, again, their human security concerns uh, and not as a wedge against China. And so when the freely associated states engage in dialogue with the United States over the status of, of the COFA, their focus is on COFA implementation, not necessarily on becoming a bulwark against China. So the goal for the United States in this context has to be to ensure that Pacific Island countries do not view our engagement in the Pacific, our stepping up our game as a temporary phase and that we would just uh, resort to where we were before, which the United States clearly underplayed its hand in the Pacific uh, and that the Pacific Island countries want assurances that we're going to have a sustained diplomatic engagement that focuses on their priorities for development assistance and economic growth. And that leads us to where we are today in the conversation, trying to understand how Pacific Island countries articulate and navigate these strains in the Pacific that they insist are not caused by them, but in fact, uh, want to assert that their own right to sovereignty, their own right to self-determination, their own rights to decision-making on how they engage all the players in the Pacific. And with that uh, brief introduction, I'm going to stop here. I'm sure we're going to have uh, more time for uh, questions for the audience as well as engagement between uh, Cleo and myself, but I wanted to open today's uh, discussion contextualizing where we are and understanding uh, the competition uh, with China in the region, the role of Taiwan, and the perceptions of Pacific Island countries uh, in that regard for these issues. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ambassador McGann. I think that uh, gives us some really valuable uh, insights into how these dynamics uh, look from the point of view of the Pacific Island countries that I think uh, needs to be you know, more widely heard uh, outside the region, particularly probably here in, in Washington, DC. Um, all right, Cleo, let's go over to you. And Cleo has some slides, which I'm going to, uh, to share here uh, with, um, Uh, Cleo is going to talk about how the major external players uh, see the uh, see the situation uh, in the region. So, um, okay. Um, all right, Cleo. Over yeah, to thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, John, and to to Jamestown for for having this topic, and to Ambassador again, uh, for from whom I've learned so much, and who has um, shown what you can do if you're a diplomat in the field who actually uh, cares about your job and, and works hard and does things, it's, uh, it makes an enormous difference. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for, for what he's done and continues to do for the region and beyond. Um, this is a little bit daunting uh, because Ambassador McGann is here, so I'm gonna, gonna do my best. Um, I'm looking, as mentioned, at uh, kind of what, it, what it's looking like from external players, but as Ambassador McGann said, you need to understand what the perspectives are domestically in order for that to make any sense. Um, and I'm gonna look at two regions. Uh, one is, uh, again, as Ambassador McGann mentioned, the freely associated states, um, which are the countries, there are three countries that are, um, that are the US's strongest allies on the planet. These are three countries who are independent countries who have handed over their defense and security to the United States to manage. No other country has done that. They rely completely on the United States for their defense and security. And that is not by compulsion, that is by choice. And that choice can change. 
Uh, and that's why it's so important that the agreement that underpins that relationship, which is the compacts of free association, which are currently up for renegotiation, be resolved uh, quickly and efficiently and uh, to uh, everybody's satisfaction. Uh, Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, uh, uh, Manasseh Sugavari, uh, uh, surrounded by his recently arrived uh, Chinese police trainers next to the Chinese ambassador. Um, to get us uh, There we go. Oops, we almost had it. Sure, yeah, there we go, thank you. So um, this is an enormous area that we're talking about. So if you put uh, the Northeast um, bit of the United States up by Hawaii, you, you get, it covers about one sixth of the planet and there are uh, over 20 different countries in the region. Um, it is also the front line between Asia and the Americas. We know this from uh, World War II. These are highly important locations. Um, and we're gonna look specifically at one island or one atoll within this zone. Uh, yep, next slide, please. Which is Kwajalein, uh, Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Um, it, you may think that it's, it sounds like it's not really, um, in the middle of anything, but it actually is right in the middle of everything. Highly strategic location. Um, it is a small atoll. Uh, it's in the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands is one of these freely associated states uh, that is in a compact of free association with, with the United States. The Marshall Islands recognizes Taiwan and the Marshall Islands is no longer in the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Marshalls, and I'm going to go through a little bit of its history so you can get a sense of the, the reality of the leadership in the region. How strategically important they are. So in the 17th and they were on their own. Technically coming from Taiwan. Then in the 17th, 18th century, you had Spain. And after that, uh, in 1885, Spain gave them to Germany. Yeah, that's fine. You can leave it here. Germany lost them. Yep, next slide. Yeah, Germany uh, lost them after World War I to Japan. So that whole zone, the zone that's now what are in a mostly compact or free association with the United States, um, was actually the Japanese mandate after World War I. So between the two wars, uh, Japan... Uh, was the colonial power in the region. And um, it's, that's why if you go to Palau, there are um, a lot of Japanese loan words. There, there are Japanese fishermen who married into local families. And there was a, a, a relatively kind of benign expansion of Japanese influence during those years. Um, next slide, please. This then, as, as the Japanese empire started to uh, kind of expand, uh, Japan started talking about um, this greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And, they, and the language that China uses now, it, it's not accidental that it sounds familiar because uh, China has looked at um, strategic positioning and importance of the region and uh, has taken was being promoted during that time by the Japanese was the idea that you've got these colonial up in your right and left-hand corner of the UK and the US in this case, and they're the ones that are creating all the problems in the region and making life very miserable for the people of the islands. Next slide, please. Yeah, so if you just had it all under a Japanese flag, then uh, the locals would be happy and peaceful and prosperous and uh, poor UK and US would be miserable, but you know, who really cares? And as that expansion was happening, of course, you ended up with um, 
what's going to be commemorated this week, which is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal, where um, the US at great cost, um, uh, very high numbers of, of fighters uh, had to liberate these islands. Next slide, please. And going back to Kwajalein, uh, Kwajalein was liberated in February 44. Um, it, it was one of the last great stands on the Japanese side. Over 5,000 Japanese and Koreans were killed in Kwajalein. This, this is, again, remember, very small location, but highly strategically located. Um, 177 Americans were killed, uh, over 1,000 wounded. Uh, this is what the atoll looked like um, after, after that battle. Next slide, please. The, after World War II, this region, Kwajalein and this region that had been that Japanese mandate went back to the UN and the UN handed it to the US as a trust territory. This is one of the only strategic areas designated by the UN, in fact, the only strategic area designated by the UN. And it was given to the US to manage as a location that was considered highly strategic. Next slide, please. The US used Kwajalein uh, as a military site and including in 1946, it was the command center for Operation Cross nearby Bikini Atoll. Next slide, please. And Kwajalein is now the site of the uh, Ronald Reagan missile defense uh, test site. It is still an active uh, military site. Um, this is just to yeah like, uh, yeah this is just to give a sense of that's fine you can leave it there. one nation specific among many that has gone from uh, uh, to the compacts by choice this free freely associated states these are highly contested and complicated locations the leaders of the region are very knowledgeable and they know the cost of, uh, of, of failure. Um, when, the, when the Marshall Islands went independent, um, they decided to enter into these compacts of free association with the United States. The two other countries are the Federated States of Micronesia and Palau. The agreement means that they can work in the US, they can serve in the US military. And in fact, they're, um, they have, uh, sorry, um, they have, they work in the US military at higher rates than, the, uh, than in many US states. Uh, they have a unique defense and security arrangement. This is a huge return on investment for the US. It underpins the entire US defense posture in Asia. This pushes the front line of US defense posture off of Hawaii and off to the coast of Asia. The cost of the US being in that region was extremely high, the cost in lives and treasure and the cost of getting it back would be enormous. Um, without it, Japan, the Philippines and Australia and South Korea become very hard to defend. This is how important this region is to the United States. Yeah, next slide, please. China knows this. And there was a book that was written in uh, 2011 by Jian Yang, who ended up in the New Zealand parliament. This is a whole other story. Um, when about how the Pacific Islands play into China's grand strategy. And he wrote, China's growing involvement in the South Pacific is part of China's growing involvement worldwide. An isolated study without understanding China's grand strategy and overall foreign policy goals can be misguided. And he said that the grand strategy goals were based on China's concept of comprehensive national power, which was adopted in the 1990s and has constituted the foundation of China's foreign policy. Next slide, please. How comprehensive is that comprehensive national power? We got a sense of it uh, in 2014 in a speech given by Xi Jinping to inaugurate China's National Security Commission. He said the NSC would integrate territorial security, military security, economic security, cultural security, social security, technology security, information security, ecological security, resource security, and nuclear security. This is how they go in to, to the Pacific Islands. This is incredibly important. They go in an completely comprehensive way. Goal is next slide. Yes, boy. Yep. Sorry, I was having trouble hearing you for a sec, but I think you're back. 
Okay, can you can you hear me out okay? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, when China goes into the Pacific countries, it, the goal is to shift it from goodwill to support to dependency. There's a whole range of techniques that it uses in a kind of unrestricted warfare way, uh, commercial, infrastructure, casinos for money laundering, high level visits, everything you'd expect. And uh, the result is that in 2019, we saw two countries, Caribous and the Solomon switching from Taiwan to China. Next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna take a look quickly at the Solomons because that's, I think, what brought a lot of people here today. Um, uh, they switched in, uh, in 2019, as mentioned, but it, it One of the provinces, while well, we get to the next slide, one of the provinces, Malaita province, uh, said it didn't want any CCP investment in the province. And one of the reasons it stated was because they, they acknowledge the freedom of religion as a fundamental right and further observes the entrenched Christian faith and belief in God by their people, therefore reject the Chinese Communist Party and its formal systems based on atheist ideology. This is very important. It's, it's important to understand that um, for some people in the region, it's their self-identity in terms of uh, people of their family. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the leader of Malaita province, uh, Daniel Sudani, needed healthcare. And the, there was a kind of an exportation of China's social credit system where the central government refused to fund his healthcare uh, unless he accepted China. And he wouldn't. He was uh, literally willing to die rather than take Chinese money. In the end, um, the Taiwanese stepped in and ensured that he got the medical treatment he needed in Taiwan. Um, this is a kind of shows how at a very per personal level, China is trying to affect um, political governance in the, in the region. Next slide, please. They also bought about 39 out of the 50 members of parliament and local politicians were saying, this is gonna lead to violence. This is destabilizing our country. It's creating, uh, it's, it's building on existing fault lines and creating a situation where we're, we're going to have violence. Next slide. And they had violence. In November, there were riots in the Solomons and they burnt down a huge uh, section of downtown. Next slide, please. Which justified the Australians sending in uh, troops. Now, uh, many domestically were, that that Australian intervention was keeping this unpopular pro-PRC government in power and had the Australians not intervened, there probably would have been a no-confidence vote that would have been out. Um, it's unclear why the Australians went in, but it's, it's worth underlining there is no U.S. embassy currently in the Solomon Islands and Australian and New Zealand interests are not necessarily U.S. interests. This shows the danger of outsourcing foreign policy. Following on that, uh, because the Australians had set the precedent of sending in security troops, uh, the Chinese could send in their own security troops. And we ended up with this, which is the Chinese Solomon Island Security Agreement, um, which uh, is to maintain social order, protect Chinese citizens in major projects. And it was followed by proposed China Pacific Islands country for the whole region development vision and a five-year plan. Next slide. I won't go into it, but it includes elements that are as detailed as fingerprint testing and cooperation, uh, positioning of uh, supplies for HADR, all that sort of stuff. Next slide, please. Chinese Foreign, Poli Foreign Minister Wang Yi. of the countries that he visited, what you end up seeing is the putting together of essentially their own first island chain off the coast of Australia to potentially interdict the countries. It's, it's ex extremely problematic. Next slide, please. 
And the people of the region, as mentioned, know what they're seeing. And there was a letter put out by the president of the Federated States of Micronesia, David Penuelo, where he said that that visit and what was proposed by the Chinese was the most single most game-changing proposed agreement in the Pacific in any of our lifetimes. And he made it explicit. To be clear, China's long-term goal is to take Taiwan peacefully, if possible, through war, if necessary. And that they knew that he thinks that this is all about getting the Pacific Island countries online in order to uh, be in a position for China to take Taiwan, if necessary. I'm going to stop there um, and uh, and go to Q and A. But just so, just the point of all of this is, there the zone is uh, highly active, has been highly active for a long time. The people of the country countries know it, and as Ambassador McGann said, just putting in place an anti-China policy is not going to work. We definitely uh, need something more and more comprehensive. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Cleo. That was a really uh... Great uh, overview. Sorry, I'm going to start put your video back on there. Um, all right. Um, well, there's so so much uh, to to chew on and think about uh, after both of your remarks. Uh, I want to start, I think, with something that you both talked about, um, which is the agreement um, that China proposed, the multilateral of ten nation agreement. And I would I would kind of contextualize it a little bit more that. Uh, China's proposal of this agreement um, to the region followed a month before uh, Xi Jinping's proposal at the uh, Boal Forum uh, for a global security initiative. Uh, and of course, the region, uh, the agreement that China proposed wasn't entirely a security agreement, right? It had trade and green development and other components as well. But what I want to ask you, uh, maybe starting with you, Ambassador McGann, is how receptive uh, do you think countries are in the region uh, to this type of uh, multilateral agreement uh, involving China and the, and the countries in the region? Well, thank you, John, for that. Uh, let, let me begin uh, by stating that Pacific Island countries have at their core their concerns that their human security interests are met. Now, what does this mean in the, in the case of China? One of the things that we do know about uh, the Chinese engagement in the region is that they will never cease to uh, seize every opportunity they can to take advantage. And sometimes those opportunities are handed to them inadvertently. Sometimes uh, they're handed to them through benign neglect. I found it interesting and consistent that Cleo's presentation uh, started off with the Solomon Islands. And what's really important about the situation in the Solomon Islands is understanding that current Prime Minister Sugavari at one time was a politician receiving direct funding from Taipei. As a matter of fact, I mentioned earlier that when I traveled to Taipei to talk about uh, their uh, assistance practices in the region back in, to, uh, in 2007, one of the issues that I raised was the fact that uh, Sobavari had been demonstrating great antipathy toward uh, Ramsey, the Regional Assistance Mission Program uh, led by Australia. Uh, Sobavari is uh, by definition more of an ethnic nationalist uh, than he is pro one side or the other. And so here we had uh, Sobavari who was undermining and his political party, Ramsey, or trying to push Ramsey out of the Solid Islands and using Taiwan as a mechanism to try and do that. The interesting factor to this is that Taiwan switched its approach, stopped the red funding of politicians, and began taking a much broader, 
approach toward economic assistance and actually change how it was giving assistance to Malita Ima, right? And the support that Taiwan has on Melita Island is based primarily on that it has embarked upon a much widespread assistance program. So what does this mean? It means that uh, China was able to exploit Sobavari's antipathy toward uh, Australia, let me be very clear, it is antipathy toward Australia, all right, and to replace the still standing Ramsey security agreement with a Chinese security agreement and was able to facilitate this through ongoing Chinese funds. And this kind of gets to back to uh, your point about how Pacific Island countries deal with uh, China's framework, Pacific Island countries are responding to the great agility, flexibility, speed in which China can bring resources to bear on areas that Pacific Island countries uh, are interested in. And you juxtapose that against uh, the United States, which because of various reasons from congressional appropriations, what have you, to how its civilian agencies are funded, to how the Pacific Deterrence Initiative uh, calling for greater uh, U.S. deployments in the region, how all of that is brought to bear and how slow that works. You know, we talk about the importance of having new U.S. embassies in the region. But if you look at the current legislation, it takes three years at minimum to open up what is called an embassy. I, and, and mind you, that does not necessarily uh, evoke visions of uh, a large building uh, with a 200-yard setback uh, and 40 personnel. It could be something quite small. So let's be very clear. Uh, and that the issue uh, is that the perceptions of engagement have to be followed or actually preceded by programs of engagement in order to counter the agility and the speed in which Chinese have been able to address uh, Pacific Island country needs. Also, uh, China has the advantage of working through long-standing indigenous populations of Chinese in the region to also pursue their economic uh, interests, which is something the United States doesn't do. I also want to just, before I close the remarks, take a look back at the freely associated states. Uh, and while the situation in Marshall Islands is very important, but if we look at what happened in the Federated States of Micronesia, and although right now, uh, President Panello uh, is taking, I think, a much more favorable approach to dealing with China than his predecessors, but you have to remember that when FSM first uh, recognized Beijing, it was preceded by development assistance that was geared toward infrastructure, primarily on the main island of Chuk in Micronesia. I, and we do know at that time that because of various uh, conditions, situations on Chuk, that uh, the FSM and particularly the island of Chuk was not getting as quickly as it should the assistance from the U.S. Department of Interior that was mandated under the uh, Compact of Free Association, all right? So keep that in mind. Secondly, when we talk about, uh, again, the Compact of Free Association, uh, if we look at the irritants that uh, the uh, other free associated states uh, have had toward its implementation, right? one of the uh, uh, main problems has been 
when members uh, or citizens of the freely associated states travel to the United States under, under the COFA to work in the United States, they were not afforded benefits that the average American worker could get because they were not American citizens. Even though they paid into Medicaid, they couldn't get Medicaid. Even though um, that members of freely associated states who resulted in being wounded warriors, uh, injured in Afghanistan and Iraq, weren't able to fully get their veterans benefits because even though they had the right to serve, they weren't Americans. And while you know, I'm not criticizing the VA uh, at all, but when the VA says to a Micronesian family, no, we can't provide you financial assistance for taking care of your wounded warrior son or daughter, but we can send them to a veterans uh, administration hospital in Binghamton, New York. What do you think of that? So the point I, that I'm trying, constantly trying to focus upon is that whenever there is a way in which the United States in particular, but other partners have not stepped up to its obligations and responsibilities in the region. China has taken that, used it to their advantage, exploited it. And so we can be sure that wherever a gap in the region exists because the United States and its allies don't fill it, the Chinese will. And that kind of gets us to the situation where we are today. And back to your point, what are the perceptions of Pacific Island countries you know, their perceptions are really based on one thing. Who is going to address our issues first? And who is going to just talk, talk to us about additional assistance and who's providing it? And whether or not the gaps that we, we create in the region are self-imposed, if they are self-imposed, they are creating conditions for Beijing's exploitation. Now, stop there. Thank you. I think that that kind of raises an, an interesting point, and there seems to be somewhat of a debate on this, right? Whether um, the U.S. is sort of squandering uh, an advantage uh, in the region, right, by not coming through on its uh, province uh, promises and commitments. Uh, a, 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 and what could be, what can kind of be done done about that? Um, Cleo, is that your your sense as well that um, the U.S. has kind of been out in front, uh, but now China is making inroads, um, or or would you would you look at it a little differently? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the the U.S. has uh, withdrawn. It, it withdrew after the end of the Cold War to a large degree and assigned strategic oversight to a lot of the region, to Australia and New Zealand. Um, there were two problems with that. One is uh, their interests may not be US interests. The other is this is not one region. Um, you know, if you, it's, it's multiple regions and focusing just on the region that's north of the equator, the sort of Micronesian region, it's confusing because there's also a country called Micronesia, but the Micronesian region, uh, which includes the, five countries, including the three U.S. freely associated states, as well as Guam, which is U.S. territory with U.S. citizens and the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, there is, there is no traditional role. If, I went through the history of Kwajalein on purpose. There's no traditional role there for Australia or New Zealand. So for um, the U.S. policy to be to operate via the PIF um, and through Australia and New Zealand, Marshall Islands isn't a member of the PIF anymore. And Australia and New Zealand have no, don't have anywhere near the sort of relationship the U.S. has with the people of the region, and the people of the region have with the U.S. Um, and and it's incredibly important to to open up these new embassies. But currently, I think three of the five existing embassies don't have ambassadors. So it would be nice to just sort of work to take advantage of of what is already there. And remember that those these freely associated states in particular, are all only ever one election away from walking away from those agreements. They have blank checks on their desk. I, I can guarantee you, I, I know this, 
from China. How much do you want? 750 million, a billion? How much do you want to walk away from the COFAs? And they have and they have urgent problems now. The Palau currently, just within the last week, had that um, Wan Wang 5 spy ship, Chinese spy ship in their waters, research vessel, which is in Sri Lanka or on their way to Sri Lanka and causing such problems for the Indians. And they don't want them there. They want they 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 don't know how to get rid of them. They don't have uh, U.S. support for for getting rid of them. They know that they're going up and down their undersea cables and and tracking their all of their that sort of critical infrastructure. Um, and you know, if the U.S. isn't there to uh, meet the existing responsibilities, not just to the people of the region, but to the U.S. security uh, in, infrastructure, that's why they want. Uh, the defense and security arrangements with the freely associated states, then it's understandable that that they would be looking another way. I'd also um, just quickly on this very important topic that uh, Ambassador McGann brought up about Ramsey and how basically it created this turnkey situation for China to come in and take over. Um, it, it, what, what would be extremely helpful, what would underpin any of these conversations is to have a discussion about what is your vision as Australia or New Zealand or the United States or Japan or the Quad for this region within the next 10 to 20 years. What do you think this, this region should look like? And uh, Australia and New Zealand have been quite explicit to say what they're working towards through things like the Pacer Plus trade deal and some of these other agreements is integration. They basically want to integrate the Pacific Island countries. And again, remember that they're primarily probably only have leverage to do it in the Southern Pacific region, the Melanesian Polynesian zone, and probably not Melanesia, which is why you end up with people like Sogavari, so uh, push anti-Australia, um, integrate them into their economic and defense systems. If you're gonna integrate an independent country, you need to weaken it. You need to weaken their governance and economies in order to make them subject to, to you in order to be able to integrate them. If you weaken those countries, which we saw kind of happen during Ramsey, another country can come along that is stronger and has more money and more focus and take over those weak pieces of infrastructure. So I would argue that actually the goal shouldn't be integration. The goal should be to help these countries be as strong and independent as possible. And they will naturally align with the free world in, in that context. And that's the sort of things that Ambassador McGann is talking about in terms of listening to what they need on the human security front and, uh, and ensure that their security perimeter is defended against illegal fisheries, but also against these research vessels and all that other stuff that's happening in their waters that they don't have the capacity to defend against. But integration, you know, turning them back into colonies. Remember, both Australia and New Zealand were colonial powers in the region. And there are still countries in, in the Pacific that New Zealand calls part of the realm of New Zealand. The head of the Pacific Island Forum, who's from the Cook Islands, holds a New Zealand passport, right? This, is a, this, is, this isn't gonna work, especially not in the Micronesian countries. So we need to relook at the structure of the region and also what, what is actually the goal? What are we building towards and what are we helping countries the region build towards that will help them resist? Today, it's China. You know, before it was Japan. We don't know what it's gonna be next. We need to, uh, you know, if we can get through the next phase, we need to figure out an architecture that's going to make this zone uh, not a consistent front line as it has been for the last 120 years. And we don't want any more Guadalcanals. And John, can I uh, yeah, jump please. in real fast before Absolutely. we close? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also uh, mentioned briefly uh, was the status of Kiribati. And Kiribati is another example of what happens when the United States underutilizes its existing tools and again, looks the other way. In 1979, the United States signed a treaty of friendship with Kiribati, which actually called for many of the things minus uh, the migration uh, elements of the COFAs uh, that call for closer cooperation with the, uh, the United States and Kiribati. The Treaty of Friendship was never uh, allowed to lapse, right? because even though it had an initial 10-year life, 
none of the neither one of the two parties to the treaty exercised that. So the Treaty of Friendship actually has been restarted by the two marine protective conservation area agreements between Kiribati and the United States, which were enacted under the Bush and the Obama administrations that called for greater coordination between the two countries. We have not yet at all maximized our ability to engage with Kiribati under those existing agreements. Instead, what we find is an aggressive approach by China to change the multilateral fishing agreements and arrangements in the region by trying to persuade Kiribati to engage in a bilateral fishing agreements that essentially supersedes those around the $60 million a year uh, that the United States has uh, pledged uh, under the, the Tuna Treaty to that is actually um, taken into place uh, by the Foreign Fisheries Agency, all right, going around that. And actually, China is going around the Nauru Agreement on Fisheries, which is one of the strongest agreements uh, on fisheries protection in the region. And again, the Nauru Agreement was something that was implemented, instituted by a Pacific Island country and not by its partners. So the, the general point again is that the United States can do more by doing more, by using its existing tools. We're a charter member of the Pacific community. Actually, I think chronologically, which may have been formed before the United Nations was formed. We've had four Americans who are director general of the Pacific community, uh, which also oversees many of the crop uh, agencies. And yet we continue to underfund it, but focus on a organization that we're not even a member of. So I, I think that uh, the point of this, this morning's discussion is to understand clearly not only where we can do more, where we can step up our game, but also to understand clearly Pacific Island countries' perceptions of what that means and expectations of real partnership with the United States and its allies and a clear determination by the Pacific Island countries to assert their sovereignty, to meet their human security concerns by whoever is the highest bidder, which leads us to where we are today. Great. That is, um, I'm, I'm hearing a number of things there on kind of what the, the Pacific Island countries are looking for uh, from the US. Uh, a positive vision, uh, engagement, a role in uh, capacity building, um, and just really being more active and more, more present in the region and coming through on these commitments and mechanisms. And finally, it's not all about the PIP or the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, as I think is, is, is a, I guess um, looking ahead, and I got I know we didn't get to, in too much to audience Q and A, and I apologize to that, but I got a chat from an audience member um, asking about uh, the U.S. expanding diplomatic presence in the region. So I believe there were some new embassies announced. Ambassador McGann, you touched on this. Uh, where will be where will these embassies be, and will they make a difference uh, in, in making progress on in this engagement with the region? My understanding, the new embassies will be in Tonga, Kiribati, uh, and Solomon Islands. Mind you, uh, the engagement with those three countries have been operated uh, out of Suva for uh, Tonga and Kiribati. Uh, most of all are aware of the fact that 10 years ago, uh, we actually opened up a consular annex uh, that, was, that was built and paid for by the Tongans uh, to allow visa and American citizen services uh, to uh, be given 
uh, in, in Nukukalofa uh, and to support the quarterly visit of an American consul officer, uh, as well as whatever business the American ambassador wants to engage in. And the Tongans themselves built it at Bureau of Diplomatic Security uh, specifications. Uh, so there are ways in which we can uh, accelerate our engagement uh, without necessarily focusing on building new buildings. Uh, what we need are consistent programs. Uh, we regularly visit uh, out of Kiribati, uh, have officers who go there. But again, it's the absence of programs, not the absence of a presence that stymies our engagement. And the same uh, applies to Solomon Islands, which is currently managed out of our embassy in Port Moresby. Uh, we did have a consular agent uh, in a longstanding one working in uh, uh, Anaraya. But again, uh, I do think that uh, Cleo's point is quite correct and that most of our engagement in Solomon Islands was handled by uh, our partner countries in the region and that the periodic visits uh, from Port Moresby were insufficient. Mind you, Port Moresby also covered Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu has also been the, was the last site of a major uh, U.S. infrastructure project by the Million Challenge Corporation uh, in the Pacific. Uh, we now, by the way, uh, see uh, MCC uh, engaging more in Timor Less, for instance, building a, a major water and waste management uh, uh, project there. But the whole point uh, is that, uh, the, as Cleo mentioned, has been the absence of engagement not the absence of a presence that has caused these gaps. It's not building a building or renting office space. It's what are the programs that are in place that assure Pacific Island countries and their governments that we're there for the long haul and for them. So it's not, I'm not suggesting I'm skeptical of having more embassies. What I do think is that we have to focus more on having funded programs that address critical areas uh, and whether or not our personnel go there on a TDY basis, whether or not the office space is provided by host uh, countries. Uh, the most relevant factor is that when we go, we talk to uh, the local governments, we have something to offer and we expeditiously meet their concerns to prevent China from exploiting the lag time between our intent, our promise, and our implementation. Great. And I, that struck me about the difference between presence and uh, engagement and programs. And of course, we know that China has no shortage of programs, right? That's their, that's kind of their whole MO. So um, I guess, uh, Cleo, uh, if we can, any last words uh, from you to kind of wrap us up here, um, maybe what to think about uh, for the region uh, moving forward in the next uh, five years, um, what can the region expect um, moving forward? So we, we know it, we know the Chinese trajectory, and uh, uh, as as Ambassador Mian said, they're very good at identifying gaps and, in fact, uh, uh, building on them and creating more trouble. So we we have at least three locations where there's a. Uh, potential for very violent situations, which would be Bougainville, Malaita, and Chuuk. And unless they're kind of understood, those dynamics, they can be very easily avoided. The people of the, the region have pathways out of them. There's uh, the Townsville Peace Agreement for the Solomon situation. Uh, Bougainville is heading on a certain trajectory. It should be encouraged uh, in, a, in a way that, that keeps them in the, in the, in the family. And uh, the uh, Chuuk situation really does need to, to be addressed and figured out whether so. But there are active political warfare operations going on consistently 
from the Chinese to try to create problems. And the, and the people who, who feel it first are the people of the region. But the goal is to push the US back to Hawaii and to create this, this zone uh, where, the, where they've got this Chinese greater cro co-prosperity sphere sort of, sort of thing. Don't underestimate that. They have at least half a dozen think tanks in China just looking at the Pacific Islands. Their ambassador to Tonga now currently used to be a junior person in the uh, Tongan embassy there. He's learned the language. He has the relationships. He, he, they've got, they know everybody they're dealing with. They have deep intel files on everybody in the Pacific Islands. The Pacific Islanders know it, but they have very few tools to push back. And, um, you know, the, this is not going to go away. So the question is, do, does the U.S. engage now, send good people who know their systems and who like Ambassador McGann, Ambassador McGann is, is responsible for that Tongan uh, consul office, which was very important for building the relationship between the U.S. and Tonga. Uh, do that, those sorts of just smart things to show that the U.S. cares now. And the U.S., you know, the, the Americans are very important. You know, how many Americans died, you know, 80 years ago to, to liberate, they haven't forgotten. The, the people of the region haven't forgotten. The relationship between the US and the region is, is in blood. You know, they fought alongside the Americans. They know the stories from their grandparents. It, it, it shouldn't be undervalued. Um, we have uh, Carolyn Kennedy, Ambassador Kennedy, heading to the Solomons now with Wendy Sherman. Both of their fathers fought in, in those battles. Um, so don't, don't outsource it. You know, this is this is a, a deep, close bilateral relationship that is uh, born in the concept of fighting for freedom. And uh, if that's brought back into the fight in the political warfare field, uh, the U.S. can make very huge advances very quickly. And it's what the region is waiting for and really wants. I guess Ambassador McGann, I'll give you the last word. Um, do, do looking out over the next five years, um, you know, does the region? Uh, I guess they wouldn't say co-prosperity sphere, but it, 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 uh, the, does the region become part of China's community of common destiny, um, or is there a, a kind of an alternative uh, future uh, that you, you see? I think we cannot understate the predilection within the region, the propensity for Pacific Islands countries to want to be aligned with the United States. They want to see the United States at the table. They want to see the United States in a leadership role. Uh, they want to see the United States exercising its own capabilities to meet their priorities. If that happens in the next five years, we can assuredly push back on Chinese expansion in the region. All right, well, that's a fairly optimistic note uh, to leave us on. So uh, I wanna thank uh, everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, I'll certainly uh, be revisiting uh, this, this conversation and it will be available on our website, uh, jamestown.org and also on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, I really wanna thank our, our two excellent uh, panel panelists today uh, for giving us their time and their insights and all of you for joining us. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>